Greetings and welcome to In-Depth MDK Rasta. We are speaking with Assistant Professor, College of Design, North Carolina State University, Dr. Leslie Ann Noel. She has a new publication titled Design Social Change. She's joining us now for conversation, including the rationale behind it and its potential impact. How you do, Dr. Noel? Hi, DK. Hi, DK. Thank you for this introduction. And I'm going to say publicly, you could call me Leslie Ann. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. And the I know you're busy, busy, busy. So thank you for making the time. But I want to start off, though, because we'll get a little more into the book. But how do we look at this publication? Is it a standalone or does it need to be taken into consideration as a member of a 10-part series of design books that it came up? So it's both and, right? It is a standalone. It is, uh, uh, what happened is I worked at, at Stanford University for a year. And so it means that I'm on the, their roster and they wrote to people who, who have taught there before and said, well, what is the book inside of you? And uh, I said, well, hey, this is the, this is the book that I wanna write one about making change and they um so they bought into it and they helped me to write my individual book but all of the books in the series are about design and and design being used in really unconventional ways not graphic design or product design or it's it's like design for belonging design well mine is design social change and all of them are about very different applications of design and I really like that it's almost as though there's a modular approach, but there's a clarity of purpose that kind of binds all of them together. But even looking at that question, and I'm thinking about it, I'm a pause reason, was the book inside of you? How significant is a state of understanding yourself or understanding oneself through the process of design? Oh, wow. That's a hard question. Well, it's it's not a hard, it's a good question that you asked. Um, because actually, that question is something I've become very known for, where in the classes that I teach, I ask, um, I ask people specifically to think about who they are, and what are they bring into the design process. And I don't know why or how, but that is maybe something that has resonated significantly in the world of design. You know, when people kind of call me to talk, they're like, oh, yeah, you're the person who makes us think about positionality. And positionality is just that. Who are you in relation to the work that you do? So that actually is, even though you haven't read the book, there is actually a section in the book where I'm asking people to think about specifically who they are and all of their identities and what are they bringing to the work that they're doing as designers? You know, so like in my, I give an example and I talk about, okay, I am from Trinidad and Tobago, grew up in Digo, lived in Belmont and, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a black woman, you know, and, and I'm bringing, all of that to the design process and it makes me then ask questions in a particular way the way you might ask questions in a different way because you are dk roster um you know i'm not sure where you grew up i think you all are from south right <laughs> so i mean wherever you know the, all of the identities that you bring into the design process will lead to you asking different questions than i am asking and we need people who ask all of these different questions so I'm um, hoping that, you know, that's, that's part of the process that people will read the book and understand. Um, and that's just a little bit. I know that we'll talk about more, but read the book and understand that they do have to know who they are and what, um, what are the design questions they're interested in from that perspective. And I'm really, really glad you were able to kind of set out that context like that, because there are more and more conversations, including things like AI, uh, that left the what goes into what is the des is design. Even if you're talking about things like education, it is never totally objective. Uh, Paulo Freire talks about education for liberation, 
or for making you another cog in an established system. So how do you look at what it is you're doing with a level of intent, a level of consciousness? So understanding your position inside of the context, I think is really important because you want to design something for a specific outcome. And sometimes we, there may be more than one outcome that we don't necessarily pay attention to because of where we start from. But in terms of that positionality, and you gave some of those, you gave some of the factors that go into your position or your where you see yourself. How does design social change build on work that you've already done? Uh, if you're looking at promoting an emancipatory research paradigm in design education and practice, that's 2016, the designer's critical alphabet in 2020, the Black experience in design, identity, expression, and reflection in 2022 that you are part of, uh, even looking at the positionality wheel, because we were just talking about position, how does this build on the work that you've been doing? Well, you did a lot of homework. <laughs> um, and it's it builds on it and maybe even, it builds on other work that I've done and maybe even tells a backstory, right? Because this book is uh, a combination of quite a few ideas, right? So uh, I don't know if we ever spoke about this, but in 2017, uh, when I was working on my PhD, um, I worked with children in Maruga um, for three weeks. And I created a curriculum for our design class that was based on the work of Paulo Freire, who you just referred to. And in that design class, the children had to critique the world around them and then try to figure out what was, what was the new world, the new utopia that they wanted. And they had to create then a path. They had to draw the thing that they wanted. And then um, we didn't quite get to the last um, part where they created the path to get to that thing but that's the design process that I've been interested in for the last maybe seven or eight years and um, that that actually has a name that's not my um, I'm, I'm like the only person who, who writes about it and talks about it but it's called critical utopian action research and I didn't create that but when I saw it I just thought this is amazing to be able to really critique this world around us. And that's something that Paulo Freire talks about, building a critical awareness of the world and then being able to imagine this world that we want instead and then trying to figure out what are the steps to get there. And so all of the work that I do um, is based on those kinds of questions, right? So the critical alphabet is related to people being able to see the world more critically you know so there are always questions in the alphabet where they have to ask hmm you know they can't just accept the world they have to ask some other questions right um and then my work is also about agency and so that thing of you being able to imagine this new world and try to try to get there that's for you to see that oh the world doesn't just happen to you you do have some power and agency and you can make change. So when I went to the children in Maruga, they could see, well, okay, we don't like maybe the way the, oh, this is a funny story that they kept saying, well, our school has all of these mango trees. And I'm like, how could this be a problem? And they're like, the problem is that we have all of these mango trees and there's so many rules that prevent us from picking the mangoes. So we started to then design things to pick mangoes that wouldn't bend the rules, you know? And, and so that's a way of seeing, oh, I can influence this world and I could kind of adapt this world to suit what, what I want, right? So it's, it's all connected. And to the person who says a book like this might be subversive, looking at looking at what it is he just said with, with the, that example about picking the mangoes. So we're not men in the room, but we pick in mangoes. <laughs> well, it, you know, okay, so a lot of us are really trained to be rule followers, you know, and so the person who has always been a rule follower or the person who is setting the rules and hoping that people will follow them might think that the book is subversive, right? And, and I have actually 
um, been confronted by that kind of question. You know, when when I will say something like, okay, people are supposed to critique the world around them and then identify what needs to change. You know, people have kind of reacted, um, sometimes administrators, some people react negatively to that idea of people being critical of the world around them and proposing a new world, right? But we don't have to be afraid of that. You know, we, we don't have to be afraid of um, people deciding that something else might be what they want, right? Um, but if your society is set around people following rules, yes, that could be a little bit of frightening. I mean, I'm not actually saying anything else. I just, you know, that idea of people having agency does scare um, a lot of people. <laughs> And we want to talk about that a little more when we, when we return from the short break. We are speaking with Dr. Leslie and Noel. Stay with us. We return with more. Welcome back. We are speaking with Dr. Leslie and Noel and the, the book Design Social Change, which is, I think, just one of the books inside of her. So we've spoken about it a little bit, but in terms of laying the table and saying, okay, well, this is what the book is about. Uh, what is Design Social Change about? So Design Social Change is about the idea that we can identify change that is needed. And uh, um, so that's the critical part, you know, we, we, we can critique the world and we can say, hey, there are all of these oppressions or all of these barriers, all of these systems. So we can start to see them, but then we could figure out what do we do next? You know, how do we make the change that has to come next, right? And, you know, like, okay, somebody asked me the other day, so will we be able to change the world after this one book? Um, this book has introductory steps to making change, steps and strategies. Um, we might need a few more other, other books uh, to, to make all of the change that is needed, right? So, you know, I guess the three big ideas are building a critical awareness of the world so that we could actually see the change that is needed because a lot of us, can't see it, you know. Um, and we'll refer to Paulo Freire again. Uh, I, I believe that I'm not not misquoting him. I believe that Freire said, like, for example, when you move into the middle class, you can't see anymore the oppression that happened to the class that that happens to the class that you just left, right? And so that whole thing of building the critical awareness is. To, for you to be able to start to see things that maybe other people are telling you this is okay, but it's for you to start to see, oh, we need some change there. Then the next section of the book is about um, building emotional intelligence. So it is about you being able to understand um, people's anger, people's joy, learning to work with other people, um, I can't, I probably have a few other strategies in there, right? And then the third section is, is about designing and prototyping new futures, right? So I've divided the book into three. Actually, I'll tell you something funny that you did not ask me, right? A little backstory. Um, the book was supposed to be a cookbook, right? When the D school at Stanford asked me, what is the book inside of you? I said, I'm gonna make a cookbook about making social change. And I was gonna put in these recipes for change. And, you know, like people would read the recipe and then say, okay, I'm gonna make a change around racism and here are the ingredients and then write it, um, cook it up. The, the idea was that, okay, maybe we could make social change easy because in some places people feel that they cannot make change, right? And so it started off with that cookbook idea, but in the end, um, it morphed into something a little different. And I, I hope that people enjoy what it has morphed into. But two things, I feel like we just living in Brazil in this conversation because some of what you're saying 
in terms of the way that we position, the way that we frame, the way that we have narratives, it kind of reminds me of Dom Elder Camera, who was talking about when I give food to the poor, they say I'm a saint, but when I ask why the staff in the temple is a communist. So in terms of like looking at what it is we're dealing with and how we're dealing with it, I also appreciate the fact that it feels as though there are more philosophies and principles than incremental rules. Because I think sometimes when there are incremental rules that kind of boxes the the thought process in so that is not necessarily as transferable because there may be nuances that you miss from one space to another. But mm -hmm. that the freedom to think and to think critically while taking in this this publication, I think is something that will will bode well. But um looking forward though, uh is there what what are expectations that you have for it? What do you hope that it does? Because I remember even like that change in the world scenario. I remember one person, he made the transition eventually from saying, no, he's going to work harder on changing himself and being a better version of, of himself, which would then influence you. Yeah. Um, so my hope is that people who maybe think that they have less influence on the world actually see that they have more influence than they might have imagined, right? And then maybe they will be, um, maybe they will act on the world with other people, act on the world by themselves, um, but they will understand again their agency and move forward. So like in, um, I'm gonna put a little plug for this artwork behind me. So this artwork, behind me is a painting of Laventil by Che Loveless. And uh, I lived in Belmont for a long time. And, you know, so Belmont, Laventil, East Port of Spain is very dear to me. Um, and maybe somebody like me who lived in, in that area might say, huh, you know, this thing needs to change in this part of, you know, in our village, right? Let me come together with a few people and figure out how we're going to work on that. You know, what are we going to do next? I shared the book, an early copy of the book with um, somebody in Trinidad, really to help me with, with the proofreading. But the person reached back out to me and said, huh, let's see, what am I going to change next? And the person said, you know what, I'm going to create a, a little competition in the school that I, I'm attached to and see if we could get the young people in the school to dream about change. And so that's kind of where this, this book that they will kind of feel a little empowered or a lot empowered and know, you know, I can do something. I can, um, there's, I mentioned that thing about emotions, you know. I can hear other people getting angry or I can see other people, you know, experiencing real joy and know that those two emotions are telling me about either something that needs to be sustained or something that needs to be changed. And then I can find some people and act on that, you know, um, I can create new plans. So I'm not giving people like concrete things and saying, this is what you need to make. You know, this is what you need to do next. It's really about you, maybe, like you said earlier, having the freedom to dream and and try to figure out, oh, what could be this? What could be a really positive scenario, a, a positive version of the story that we're living in, and then try to figure out what could be some steps to get us there. So I'm hoping that people will see the book as inspirational in that way and that they will be inspired to take that idea of making change into their lives and see, do they need, like those children in Maruga, you know, do they need to change their lives, their school, their village, their country, the, you know, what is the thing that bothers them and what is the thing that needs to be changed? So that's why it's called Design Social Change. And I really appreciate the fact that, uh... I think what this allows individuals to do is to think that their version of critical analysis of the space around them is all right because and it is expected that it will be different from someone else because no two persons 
will see the same situation and the same exactly. But following on on the artist and background behind you by Trey Loveless, Lou Loveless asked the question, what will we do with what we've done? And the question, is it a matter of, and we have about a minute, so I guess I'm going to answer this the still version, but is it a matter of inclusion as much as acknowledging the work of persons or groupings that kind of may be on the periphery when it comes to design sometimes? You stumped me there. <laughs> you say you say who hmm, and I smile. <laughs> well, so I'm a person on the periphery in America, right? And because I have leaned into, I've, I've done exactly what is in the book, where I've leaned into the things that I thought needed to be changed and have just acted on the things that I saw needed to be done and people have responded to that. So I would say that to the people on the periphery, lean into who you are and figure out what are the things that you think need to be changed and figure out how you're gonna form a community around that change, right? So like my work in America has suddenly resonated with a lot of people because I'm not trying to meet other people's um, expectations or standards, or I'm just looking at design and design education and saying, okay, this is not good enough for a person like me. Well, and that like me is a black woman from the Caribbean um, who studied in South America, you know, and, and I'm using then all of these identities to think about what I think is better and I would encourage other people to do the same, right? Don't let other people tell you that your version of the world as a person from the periphery, whatever periphery is not good enough. Actually, we do need your perspective from wherever you are in the world. So bring that perspective to the kind of change that you think is needed. With that, but it's a good thing to start off stump because... <laughs> The answer, the answer was nice and we appreciate it. Well, and we once again we want to thank you for your time, Dr. Leslie and Noel, and the work that you've been putting in and continue to do. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, I'm DK Roster. This has been in depth with me. Thank you so much for joining us.